morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee and Football, presented by Texas Electricity Ratings. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined this morning by C.J. Vogel, who's standing in for Bobby Burton, and Jerry Hamilton. And there's a lot to talk about, fellas. But first, tell us where you're checking in from, yes. what you're drinking. Jerry loves to hear that, loves to see it. And if guys, anybody's seen Puff Daddy, tell us in the chat. The parents yeah. people are looking for him. <laughs> you might you might get some some money off some tips there if you if you help out. But uh, a heck of a super chat if you know where he is. <laughs> oh man, jeez, Jerry. All right, guys. Well, spring football. Y'all were y'all were over there yesterday. Got to see it in action. What's your takeaways from what you saw yesterday? I you know. I thought the offensive line, uh, one of the interesting things to me is, um, you know, the first couple of years when you went to the media window at spring practice, you know, Kyle Flood was doing a lot, a lot of coaching. And, and he he's doing a lot of coaching, don't get me wrong, CJ, but it's different. There's not – it seems like the offensive line has some really good continuity right now. These guys have been in the program a while now. I mean, obviously Brandon Baker, Daniel Cruz are early enrollees here, freshmen. But, you know, Trevor Goosby, Jaden Chapman, Connor Stroh, all these guys, you know, this while some of it's the first spring practice for Goosby, Stroh, Chapman, some of those other guys were in last spring. But there's just a lot. You see a lot of continuity. You see experienced players on the offensive line. Uh, Kyle Flood coaches those guys hard no matter what. But it's different to me. I didn't see as much correcting yesterday as in some past spring practices. So, you know, third year in the system uh, for Banks, the second year starting for Campbell, but third year in the system, Cam Williams, all those guys in the 22 class. I thought that was a, uh, I thought that was really good to see from our vantage point. And then the other thing was the big takeaway yesterday was, you know, I noticed in the in the two man drills and the combo block drills that Hayden Connor was working at center, and I said, okay, well that's interesting. I just figured he would, you know, cross train, he'd go back to left guard when five started, but. He didn't. He was still at center, and Neto was the first guard out uh, at left guard. And then the second time the ones uh, came out, it was Cole Hudson. So in five. So I thought that was interesting. Is does that mean Hayden Connor's not the starting left guard? Well, on Texas football isn't saying that. Look, they mix and match. Guys work at different spots. Jaden Chapman, uh, CJ, the first practice of the spring, he was the third team left tackle yesterday in drills. He was the second team right tackle. Brandon Baker third. Uh, so there's going to be cross-training of guys, but that was definitely interesting to see yesterday. Yeah, I'm with you in the sense that I didn't see a lot of having to redo drills in, in that sense. And also to me, the the amount of versatility that you're seeing across the board, offensive line, you're talking about guys moving and moving around that offensive line, you know, from left center or left guard to center to right guard, you know, that that's they're interchangeable to the sense that we're seeing that at a number of different positions as well. Obviously, Matthew Golden's kind of been that guy that's bounced around behind Isaiah Bond to behind Jonte, even getting some look in the slots behind DeAndre Moore. He's kind of that guy that's, you know, making sure that Texas is deep at each position there. And then obviously it's uh, cornerback as well on the other side of the ball. Sarkeesian talked about John A. Barron, Jalen Gilbo, and Austin Jordan all being able to go out and get reps at outside cornerback. So, it's really encouraging, again, the amount of athleticism that's going, going to be on the field is not going to be questioned, but also the amount of versatility is going to be a strength of this team to ensure that they'll be able to sustain going through an injury or two, like we saw yesterday with Malik Muhammad walking off the field right after the stretching lines. Yeah, and, and Coach Sarkeesian said in the post-practice uh, press conference what CJ was at, they're not major with Manny Muhammad. I think what it said he'll probably be back Wednesday or Friday, yep. uh, so – uh, say so, somebody said I heard Anna. Somebody checked in from Anna. Heck of a football team y'all had this year, yeah, man. Sure. Uh, maybe, maybe getting a move in too. Uh, we'll see about that. I don't know what's going to happen there. I've heard some heard some rumors. It would be a good one. It's a Power Five kid, uh, so we'll see what happens there. He may already be there. I may have missed it. I don't know. Uh, a lot going on, uh, Blake. I mean, look, we got the uh, women's basketball in the Sweet Sixteen facing Gonzaga. Not Mark Fuse Gonzaga. Uh, the, the girls, uh, the Gonzaga uh, women's team in the Sweet Sixteen. Um, and I know you have some details on that, Blake. Yeah, so uh, they play Friday at 7 o'clock there, as you said, against Gonzaga. And uh, I, I know it's – I can't remember where it's at, though. I know it's not in Austin. Now, Gonzaga's a 30-win team, by the way. Really good season out west. Um, 
won that four or five game. Uh, you know, they've, 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 they're, they're having a good season. That'll be a good test. I mean, anybody that watches has started watching the women's game a little bit. Look, uh, Iowa, Caitlin Clark, they got a big test last night against West Virginia out of the big 12, uh, um, I ended up pulling away late in that game, 64-54, I think was the Yeah, lot. friendly whistle in there, huh? Well, you know, you know, you got to have some of those sometimes, especially when you're at home. There's a lot of Iowa fans breathing down your neck, uh, a lot of Caitlin Clark shirts. I've, I've even seen those in the airport. It's kind of quite remarkable, honestly. But, uh, yeah, so the women are back on the court um, on Friday. Huge game uh, for Vic and, and, and the team. I mean, again, I'm, I'm going to continue to say what they've overcome this year um, in the continued discipline and – leadership from Vic and, and, and what that program is doing. He, he's just, he's doing an amazing job. As you just look around college basketball, men's or women's, and if you said you're losing your point guard, who's probably a third team, all American level player, um, could have been the big 12 player of the year, quite possibly. You said you're 12 and 0 and lose her after, after the 12th game of the season. That's a one hell of a coaching job to still be a number one seed. Um, I mean, look how the injuries have affected UConn in recent years uh, when Paige Buchers went down a couple others. So Vic does an amazing coaching job at Texas, uh, great discipline in, in, on that team. And in that program, it, it, it's, it's fun to watch. Uh, also some recruiting news, uh, CJ, um, you know, Andrew Marsh was at spring practice uh, yesterday uh, along with KJ Lacey, 2025 20, quarterback commitment. KJ also be back April 6th. April 20th, June official visit, 21st through 23rd. Uh, we reported a couple things. Reported uh, at ontexasfootball.com yesterday evening. If you haven't been over there, missed some good recruiting stuff. Um, DJ Sanders from Belleville expected on campus April 6th. As, as of right now, official visit looks to be locked in June 21st through 23rd. Uh, Josiah Sharma, a guy I'm very, very high on, uh, four-star defensive tackle out of Folsom, uh, California. Um, he's expected in this weekend. Uh, and now that could change. It could bump back to April 6th. We'll see. But uh, he's expected on campus this weekend as of right now, if not next weekend. But uh, that's big news to get Josiah Sharma on campus. Uh, then you'll get to that official visit in June with him. He's a one-time Washington commitment. Alabama very much in it. Uh, he's gonna. He's got an official visit scheduled to uh, Utah June 14th through 16th, um, and then um, he's also got a Washington in, in May, I believe. And Oregon's in it. Georgia just offered. I mean, he's one of the top D linemen in the country. Uh, so getting him on campus is good. Uh, it looks like Nick Brooks, the four-star offensive lineman uh, from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, John F. Kennedy High School. He when I talked to him two weeks ago, he's like uh, June 21st through 23rd is when I told Texas I was going to visit. But Iowa has kind of requested that last visit date. He's a one-time Iowa commitment. I think it's the Texas and Nick Brooks are getting close to finalizing June 14th through 16th official visit date. Uh, that'll be big. I mean, he's one of the top linemen in the country. Um, again, and I, I really think he's got three schools he for sure is going to officially visit. That's Georgia, and that's Texas, and that's Iowa. And I think Iowa's got a little bit of an uphill climb to get him right now. I'm not saying they can't win. He's an in-state kid. But Caden Proctor bouncing, that, that's a tough one uh, for Iowa to overcome. And uh, so we'll, we'll see there. I think NIL is a factor in that recruitment. Uh, but Texas continues, uh, CJ, to uh, that official visitors list up about 33 now. Uh, Dorian Brew will probably be June 14th through 16th. I don't think it's been finalized. I'm going to have a couple other recruiting nuggets this morning after a little while after our show. I'll, I'll a couple other guys that I think are going to officially visit. But uh, CJ, uh, you know, recruiting moving along. I know you were at Elite 11 on Sunday. Yeah, certainly was. Got to see KJ Lacey throwing the ball a little bit. Uh, the Texas commit looked good. Uh, I liked what I saw of him moving outside of the pocket and the drills that they had them kind of escaping pressure off the edges, whether it be from the backside or coming from the front. Uh, he looked good rolling out. He had a nice touch on his ball. And I think that's really the thing that stands out to me is, you know, similarly to Quinn Ewers, there's not always going to be a big, you know, fastball coming from KJ Lacey. This is a guy that has a lot of touch and a lot of precision whenever he is uh, on the move or even in the pocket. That's kind of his game is, is, is not throwing that 98 mile per hour heater that you'll see at times from guys. Keelan Russell, on the other hand, he has that part of his game, but I think right now KJ a little bit more refined as a passer. 
uh, in his game. Uh, Keelan Russell did have a really good game. The SMU commit also talked afterward uh, that Texas is a school that would change his commitment if an offer comes whenever he visits for the spring game April 20th. Uh, we'll see what Texas opts to do with the two of those guys. Obviously, as you mentioned, Jerry, K.J. Lacey's coming in the 6th, the 20th, and for his June official visit. Right now, the two of those guys are who Texas has eyed in that, that uh, 2025 quarterback class. There were two other guys, classes below, that really stood out to me as well. The first is uh, Jake Fetty out of Del Valle, El Paso. Really impressive arm. You talk about a rocket arm and a guy that has that zip whenever the ball uh, you know, leaves his hand. That was him. He said that Tex, uh, Texas Tech and TCU are the two standing out early to him. Uh, he said Coach A.J. Milby should be expecting uh, a trip out west to the uh, Texas Panhandle. Uh, this spring to watch him throw. And the other was Weston Nielsen, who Texas is very familiar with. Right out of Bastrop High School, 2027 quarterback. Uh, really, I mean, I was I was impressed by him. He looks a little bit like K. Clubnick. And I'm not saying that he's going to have that athleticism, but he does have a, a bit of that moxie to him. Uh, it looks similarly whenever he, you know, kind of rolls out. You see the uh, the ability on the run to make throws uh, that Cade was, you know, so famous doing at Westlake as well. So uh, A.J. Milby, Sarkeesian, stopped by in the winter. They'll be back in the spring to watch him. He has 11 offers at the moment, Oregon being his biggest. All right, uh, real quick, guys. I need to say a couple of things here. Henry James, if you'll send your question normal, I will fix your super chat for you. We'll get that going. And then I need to correct myself. Women's basketball actually plays at nine o'clock. It was seven Pacific because they okay. play in Oregon. And this is also the first time they've ever played Gonzaga history of the program. So very cool there. But uh, we need to tell folks out there about Texas electricity ratings, and that's what I'm going to do here. So for those of y'all still living in Texas and in major cities with deregulated electricity like Dallas and Houston, you understand that the deregulated electricity market can be confusing. Texas electricity ratings is a shopping website that lets you compare prices, read customer reviews, and find a good electricity that fits your needs. It also filters out a lot of the gimmicky plans on websites such as Power to Choose that actually tricks customers into expensive bills. So if you're in the market for a new electricity plant, go shop TexasElectricityRatings.com slash OTF for all your electricity needs and hook them. Okay, well, uh, Jerry, I know one second. Henry James Super Chat. <laughs> oh, we got it here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, he said, oh, gosh, if Toa Katoa and Sadir Mitchell got on a seesaw, who would be in the air? That may be the best super chat of all time. And by the way, Toa Katoa, the uh, 2026 uh, offensive guard from uh, uh, Euless Trinity that Texas officially offered yesterday. He'll be on campus April 13th. He's, you know, 6'5", 370-ish, but a really good athlete, long arms, tremendous player. I've said before and on TexasFootball.com, there's two offensive linemen in the state in 26 that I could pick up the phone right now and commit to Texas. John Turntine was one, and now that Katoa has been offered, that's two. So those are two guys that are, I mean, they're takes right now for Texas. It won't happen, but I'm just saying, if either one of those guys just wanted to jump in, Texas didn't turn those guys down. I mean, John Turntine is going to, if he's not a top 10 guy in the country next year, I'll be surprised. Uh, he, he's elite, elite, elite. If you haven't watched his video, go watch it. But as far as uh, Henry James' super chat, Man, that's a tough question. There. That is a tough one. Uh, <laughs> I know tough this, one. The seesaw wouldn't survive. No. <laughs> that, that thing's splitting in the middle. Katoa, I mean, the, there are reports that he was north of 380. I don't think – I think he's right around 375 from what I've been able to hear. Uh, Katoa, again, if you watch his film, which we posted last night on TexasFootball.com, uh, he doesn't move like he's that big. He looks like he's probably in that 330 range with the history of playing running back. Uh, in middle school. That's kind of how I see him as a guard. They ask a lot of him in in, in, in that Euless Trinity offense when it comes to pulling, uh, getting out in front as a lead blocker. Again, 375 pounds. It doesn't look like he, uh, uh, it, it, it's a detriment to him. He carries it very well. And I'm like, I'm with you, Jerry. He's a very talented prospect that Texas is going to be after. Yeah. So, so we had somebody asked, who's the, uh, the top, the best recruit to ever come out of Euless Trinity. Well, I went to the old wiki for that one uh, because I didn't want to miss anybody. Miles Turner is way up there. Okay, we're talking, if we're just talking who's come out of Euless Trinity, uh, Ollie Gordon, obviously, at, at Oklahoma State. 
may have a claim to that one day. Uh, Dimitri Nance, former NFL running back. Um, Brian you know, Nance. Remember him, the linebacker? Well, he was a five-star at one time. Ryan McBean came out of Euless, went to Oak State, was a really good DN. Um, and then, you know, look, you go way back, Mike Babb was a tremendous player uh, back in the day out of Euless. Euless has had a ton of Division I Power Five football players for years and years. Uh, but they they probably had seven, eight guys come through uh, that went to the NFL at one point. Trevor Vitito as a quarterback, wasn't as highly recruited. Daenerys McGee. Uh, so they've had their share of guys, Sam TV. Uh, but, you know, honestly, you're probably looking at Miles Turner at, at this point. Miles Turner's having a tremendous NBA career. Obviously, Chris Ogden recruited him to Texas in basketball. Uh, one of the rare recruitments that he went to the podium and Texas didn't know if they were getting him and neither did the second and third place finishers. He literally was one of those recruitments he didn't tell anybody until he announced. So those are rare. Normally, you tell the losers you're not coming or you give the winner a hint, but there wasn't much hint uh, in, in that. Uh, so um, I, I'm not sure what weed 20 is getting at there, but um, yes, ba Bab was a grown man coming out of high school. There's no doubt about that. Brandon Carter was one of my favorites, Sherry. Yeah, he was really ended good. up at TCU, did everything for them. Awesome player. Yeah. All right, Jerry, one thing I know you wanted to talk about was Shadur Sanders' comments. Oh, yesterday. please. Yes, bring this up. Thank you. <laughs> so, let me uh, play this Bla video but, here. But congratulations to Blake on getting a 11 million impressions on a tweet. 10, now. 10 million. 10 million. Well, it's going to 11 after this. Um, so, But look, okay. I mean, hey, Shadur, th hey, that'll get you 10 million with what he just said. <laughs> here we go. I came from a private school, so... At the end of the day, I dealt with a lot of negativity, a lot of hate, a lot of everything I done dealt with already year after year. I came from a small private school. Uh, all the other kids was going big, you know, power five, and they went to big 6A, Texas 6A schools and stuff. I don't see those same kids around. I don't see them excelling in their programs or whatever they're doing. So I've always been against the odds, like, in different ways. I came from a private school. So there you go. Okay, Just so I got, a few, I got a few things to say. <laughs> um, you know, we had Shadur in the Under Armour game when I was at ESPN, uh, uh, Under Armour. And, uh, you know, I was used to be part of Deion Sanders' Prime 21 camp. So I've seen Shadur kind of grow up. Um, one, I appreciate any chip on a shoulder an athlete has that motivates him. Okay. Uh, but two, I mean, I, you know, I just had to kind of laugh out loud at this one, uh, because I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, Jalen Milrow and Quinn Ewers were starting quarterbacks in the college football playoff last year from six, eight teams. And if you kind of go down the, the old four, a new five, a, the old five, a new six, a, I mean, Jalen hurts. Well, it came out of channel view. Uh, you know, he won district MVP in that North shore district, which is hard to do at channel view. Hadn't been done before. It might not be done again. I mean, you just got Matthew Stafford's Highland park. I mean, you go down the list of guys. Um, and you know, I mean, I, I, I know he had it rough there, but, uh, um, and I, like I said, I like Shooter. I appreciate a chip on his shoulder. But, man, I mean, you just start with quarterbacks, guys. And, I mean, the guys from big schools have been pretty successful uh, at the college level and the NFL level. I mean, the two guys in the college football playoff that Shooter was watching last year, I don't think he uh, kind of checked the, checked himself, checked himself before he made that comment, whatever he was getting at. Obviously, Sam Ellinger. Um, you know, look, we had uh, Ed Oliver. Kyle Trask was interesting because he was at Manville. Uh, but he was – he was kind of a part-time starter for them because the Eric King was over there as well. Two quarterbacks from that team made it in the NFL. But, um, you know, I think uh, – uh, but I agree with living rent-free in UT. The Sanders are all about clickbait this time of the year. And I do think uh, there's a method to their madness. But that was – hey, the method to their madness was really good for you, Blake. Yeah, I'm not Because you that. saw it and acted on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If they could just let me know anytime they say something a little outlandish, I would definitely appreciate it. So I, so I can benefit for sure. All right, guys. Well, we got uh, plenty of time for questions. So get your questions in. We'll get to as many as we can. And let's go ahead and start here. We'll go back to some of the practice talk. Captain Americano, who's looking good right now, according to sources. Who are your biggest surprises, surprises good or bad, so far? 
I'll tell you what, Sarkeesian had a lot of praise yesterday for uh, Trey Wisner, the running back out of Waco Connolly, uh, DeSoto as well for his senior year. Uh, that's a guy, I mean, you, we've talked about him in the past, obviously. Bobby's a big fan of his. Uh, but anytime you see him on the field for, for special teams, whether it be punt or kickoff, I mean, that's a guy that brings a lot of energy. You know, he, he, he really runs well with the ball in his hands. He had a good scrimmage or a live practice session on Saturday as well. Uh, Sarkeesian shouted him out, and he was that first-team gunner, again, on punt team this this uh, this this past evening uh, right next to G uh, Gavin Holmes. So the two of them trying to carry on what Keaton Crawford and Keelan Robinson made so special a year ago, uh, I, I think Trey Wisner is going to be a guy that continues to have impact even if the ball is not in his hands. He's kind of one of those spark plug energy guys that you could throw on the field and see results made even, uh, again, uh, if the ball's not going his direction. Yeah, and I think this guys like Trey Wisner are so important to, um, you know, whether you what do you think the term uh, that, uh, you know, it, uh, I lost my train of thought here, but culture, sorry. Culture is overused at times. There is an important piece to that. Trey Wisner is a, a great culture guy. You know, the guys that come in, and they, they understand process, right? They, they they don't live in the expectations of now, instant gratification. Are so big for a program continuing to ascend and having consistency over time. I mean, that, that's a huge thing. And guys like Trey Weiser, who will give it up on special teams, right? Give up their body on special teams to impact winning. Um, they understand, okay, there's going to be multiple running backs play at Texas. Uh, and I didn't mention running backs early, and I, I want to, uh, because there I, I had an observation yesterday from the media window running back. Uh, but guys that give to the program and understand the process and are out for instant gratification on the field, those guys are hugely, massively important to this program moving forward. Um, so, again, you know, some of that is offensive line. You know, you look at guys like Trevor Gooseby, Jaden Chapman. Some of those guys have to wait their turn. Um, you know, and, and so having that enough of those guys in your program is so big for your message, your daily message, whether that's Tory Becton's message, whether that's Steve Sarkeesian's message, whether that's a uh, position coach's message. You have to have a lot of those guys in your program that impact winning, even when they're not scoring touchdowns or making big plays necessarily. Uh, they can impact winning on a day-to-day -day basis outside of practice. Uh, and I think Trey Weisner is clearly one of those guys. I'll tell you another one. Trey Moore is clearly one of those guys. Now, he's going to be an impact guy on the field this year. But the, the way Sarkeesian continues to speak about Trey Moore, he's checked every single box since he's been at Texas with the, what they're looking for from a player in the program. All right. For this next question, fellas, we're going to head over to the ontexasfootball.com forums. K. John says, if you could design the Texas football roster today, what would be your position group or groups that must have elite players to compete within the SEC? And you can't say all of them. No, it's not all of them. I mean, look, obviously you leave quarterback out of this, right? I mean, the only guy – the only coach that really has won with different quarterbacks, different strength, and a number of them was Nick Saban, right? His He wasn't totally quarterback dependent. So leave him out and leave quarterback out because Sarkeesian said it's the most important position, and especially in his scheme, especially on his team. So let's leave that out. In the SEC, which if, you, if you're a top two or three team in the SEC, that means you're going to be ranked in the top five, six in the country. Um, so that, that that's one thing to know. Defensive line and edge and offensive tackle are huge positions in the SEC. Um, you have to be really good at offensive tackle. I mean, just think about uh, two times Texas has played Alabama. I mean, whether they had great games against you or not, Dallas Turner, Will Anderson, just go down the list of those guys. Think about the guys Georgia's had, right? Those guys that are screaming off the edge. At the higher level in the SEC, you have to be really good at offensive tackle to protect your quarterback. Um, you have to be really good uh, on the defensive line all the way. You have to be able to rush the passer off the edge. You have to be able to put pressure on those long-arm athletic tackles in the SEC. And then up the middle, uh, you have to have physical strength and toughness. I, I'm not saying you have to be the most talented like an Alabama was 10 years ago or like Georgia has been, uh, but you have to be big enough tough enough and physical enough. You can you can get you can have a bunch of third round picks, uh, but they have to have that combination in the SEC. 
Yeah, and if you don't, you better pray that your secondary is just as elite in that regard as well. Cornerback was where I was going to go as well, just because you're you're dealing with the extra level of speed in the SEC that we've talked about. Coming from you know guys like Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, uh, those guys are a little bit faster than what you'll see coming from Iowa or Nebraska or Oklahoma, Arkansas, uh, that kind of area where a lot of the Big 12 is recruited when you go north of Texas. Uh, again, the cornerback to me is a spot where if you don't have your pieces on the interior of your defensive line, you better hope that you have two guys out, out wide that are studs that can keep up with who you're going to be facing on a weekend, week out basis. Uh, before we I, I, I want to add one more. I want to add one more. On some level, you have to have some physicality at your running back position in the SEC. Uh, if you look at Georgia and you look at Alabama, the two teams that have been best in the SEC, um, and if, okay, if you go back to when Tebow was at Florida, whether it's him or their run game, you have to have some semblance of physicality, whoever's carrying the football in that league. It doesn't mean all of them have to be, but you do have to have some of that. And that's one of the things I was going to talk about. I really like about the Texas running backs right now and watching them yesterday, each player go through reps, different strengths. Every, every running back has different strengths to me. After you watch them, the more you watch of them. But – I really like what Texas did with this this freshman class of running backs because they really fit what that inside zone scheme and what Texas is going to need in the SEC. That doesn't mean Jaden Blue won't be a tremendous player, but the physicality and the frames of Jarrett Gibson and Christian Clark, I think very much fit what Texas needs in the SEC. That doesn't mean all backs have to be the same. I like that all the running backs are different but you have to have some of that in that conference. Jerry, the running back room's future is so bright, you better get your shades out. And while you're doing that, I need you to tell folks out there about one of our newest sponsors in Gooder. Look, there's only one way to do this read. You got to pop on the Gooders. I mean, look, I was at a uh, volleyball tournament over the weekend, and everybody was wearing the Gooders. I was, I was shocked at, you know, just how many people were wearing them. Look, these are stylish sunnies starting only $25 a pair. No slip, no bounce, all polarized, all fun. 50,000 plus five-star reviews. They come with a one-year warranty, 30-day uh, free returns. It's pop art for your face, but it makes it in fashion. No slip, no bounce, all polarized, all angles. Uh, I had mine on all weekend. And I have them on for this read and for I'll probably have them on when I talk about Alfred Collins this year, too. I mean, they're 100 percent polarized and only twenty five dollars because they're so affordable. I never worry about losing them or breaking them. They have that kind of rubbery comfort feel to them. You're not going to snap. I mean, they're but they're sturdy at the same time. I love their names. Back nine blackout flamingos on a booze cruise. Look, there's your little flamingo. Uh, and then there's the donkey goggles, uh, great for running, cycling, working out, golfing, going to the beach, hiking, or just chilling. I don't do well with the just chilling part, but when I do, I'm going to have my gooders on. Damn, you're a pro. You're a pro, Jerry Hamilton. Who broke to pay attention and said, you look like a character out of an 80s movie with those shades on. You're a boss. <laughs> so go check out Gooder and thank them for sponsoring today's show. And uh, let's move on here, guys. Ivory Martin says, would it be a surprise if DeAndre and Ryan Wingo take the majority of snaps away from Matthew Golden and Silas Bolden? Ooh. Very much for me, CJ. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, this is the, the, the good problem to have with this wide receiver group because DeAndre Moore is taking that first team uh, slot reps at the moment. Ryan Wingo, again, we've talked about his athleticism and the combination of speed, size, and ability to go get the football so far. He's been a standout amongst this early enrollee bunch. But, hey, Matthew Golden's really surprised me, and he looks smooth. I think that's the definition of the way that he plays football. Everything that he does, whether it be running routes, the get off or just receiving the football, it just looks smooth. And I think that there's a level of, uh, you know, you talk about that chip on the shoulder that you have to have at times. It's not Shador Sanders' level, obviously, but Matthew Golden, I think, has that. Because for his entire, you know, time coming into Texas, he's been pegged as that third guy from the portal. He, you know, obviously Isaiah Bond, you, you know what you're getting with him. Silas Bolden, 
750 uh, receiving yards last year, over 50 receptions as well. I think Fulcher looking at him as kind of that, you know, one and done level guy, uh, both of them really. And Matthew Golden's kind of fallen to the wayside a little bit when you talk about Jonte Cook being on the campus as well, plus Ryan Wingo and who else are, is already there. Uh, I, I've been really surprised by uh, Matthew Golden. And I think that he's going to be a guy that, you know, has a big role for this team, whether or not that's going deep or underneath. We'll, we'll, we'll see underneath was kind of his strength at Houston. But uh, Silas Bolden is a question mark to me because, hey, we're talking about this, these guys on campus right now making noise during spring practice for a transfer coming in in June, getting acclimated to the, the system, the nuances of the wide receiver position in the Sarkeesian offense and getting uh, that rapport built with Quinn Ewers. That might be a little bit of a slower role than what we're seeing right now with these wide receivers. So uh, I think you'll see a little bit of DeAndre Moore and Ryan Wingo, regardless of who that starting rotation is as the season gets going. Okay, then we're going to stay on wide receivers here for just a second, guys. Phil McIntosh says it's early, but can you tell anything about Jonte, how he's looking with all these new guys? Yeah, I think Jonte is, um, you know, I think he, my expectations of him are kind of already in place. Um, Jonte is a really strong route runner. Um, he really understands, uh, route running route concepts. I mean, he's trained with margin hooks for years, right? Those guys come in advance, um, in that regard. Uh, you know, I, I just, I love his, the personality, um, uh, of Jonte, you know, some things outside of what you see on the football field, even yesterday, you know, him and Deandre Moore, just kind of the way they competitively were getting under each other's skin in the 30 minute window, not really in a bad way, in a good way, right? Just some comments they'd make to each other after routes. I think he brings some energy. Um, it, it's kind of infectious. I think people saw that in recruiting uh, with the way he tried to help the recruiting class at Texas. But as far as, you know, his thing has always to me been, it, it, he has good hands. I think, and if you talk to people in uh, DeSoto, they always talk to him about concentration. Like, being 100% locked in, concentrating, rep to rep. I still think that is going to be the thing he continues to battle a little bit. Yeah, he, he may have a drop here and there in practice, and it's not hands. It's just more of a concentration thing if you've watched him. We had him in Under Armour camps, Future 50, all those things. Uh, so Jonte's got really good hands. I just think he's got to stay locked in all the time, and that's part of being a gr uh, young football player. But I expect Jonte to have a good season uh, at Texas. 35, 40 catches would not surprise me. I think he'll make big plays. I think one of the things for a young receiver, too, if you saw last year when he got in the game, sometimes when he caught the ball, he tried to start ver uh, horizontally crossing the field to work to the sidelines. In high school, you can get away with that because you're going to be faster than most guys. I think a big thing you'll see year two in his limited in-game reps last year I think he's going to catch the ball and get vertical quicker after the catch. I think that's one of the things young receivers have to learn. It's so easy in high school to catch the ball on the move and just stay horizontal and get to the sidelines and take off down the sidelines. That's not going to happen at the power five level. So I think he's going to do a much more, a much better improved job of getting up the field vertically after the catch in year two. And let's jump over to quarterbacks for a moment. Brendan Bauer Sox says, any word on how Trey Owens has looked so far into spring? He looks like he belongs. Um, you know, CJ, I don't, I don't think – I think he's got better feet in the pocket than uh, maybe I gave him credit for. He moves his feet with pretty good quickness in the pocket. Um, and, and, you know, look, if you do that, he's going to be an accurate quarterback. Uh, he works with J.P. Tillman in the Houston area. He's done a good job with quarterbacks in the Houston area, former Missouri quarterback. Um, and I think Trey Owens is, is a good learner. He's a listener, uh, and he's able to take things to the field. I think he's a cerebral guy. He's confident. Though. CJ, the one thing about him is he's confident. He believes he belongs, and he believes he's going to compete with anybody. Yeah, absolutely. That was, you know, kind of those one of those uh, notions that I was able to take from him, you know, spending so much time with him uh, his senior year is – you don't see Cypress Fair winning too many games in the playoffs, especially when you're facing Katie in the playoffs. So that was a big note for me. Obviously, the, the Houston Touchdown Club offensive MVP for, for the 2023 season. He, he's got that moxie at, with him at that quarterback spot. And I, I think one thing that's really underrated with him is he played with an offensive line that might not have been the strongest at Cy Fair. As a result, he was asked to move around the pocket a lot. And at 6'5", 235 pounds, you don't expect him to be that great of an athlete at that size, 
But he is and inside the pocket. He has great feel and he has great awareness coming behind him. Uh, the key for him is going to be, you know, understanding defenses, reading uh, the route concepts, zone looks, uh, whether they're in man right away. He's been really good when there's one read uh, in, in seven on seven and he knows where to go with the ball upon the snap. The next step, obviously, in that next level in his game is saying, all right, if that first look isn't there, where next do I go and how do I work down to my check down? Uh, again, that's just the the typical progression that you see with every quarterback, especially young ones. But Trey Owens right now, like you said, Jerry, looking like he belongs. All right. And then while we're on the subject of quarterbacks, let's take this question from Ski Brett. Can we talk about Quinn and the multiple self sacks he ran into last year? Is he not feeling the pocket? He doesn't seem to have escapability, which is a natural feeling kind of thing. Get, going back to what we said about Trey, I mean, at some point it's a blessing and a curse whenever you play behind a great offensive line in high school because sometimes you just don't develop that natural feel of when pressure's there, when that quarterback clock is going off in your head and you know when to get the ball out or escape or throw the ball away. Uh, for Quinn at South Lake Carroll, I mean, he he had a great offensive line. You know, he, he didn't have kind of a ragtag bunch that you see with some of these other guys like Trey Owens, uh, who kind of develops that feel out of necessity to stay alive as a quarterback in the pocket. I thought Quinn last year had a, a, a little bit better approach when it came to his athleticism and ability to make plays happen with his legs. We saw multiple touchdowns over 30 yards with his legs, something that we didn't necessarily see a whole lot of his, uh, his first year as a Longhorn. That continual growth will need to be there because, like we said, that self-sack problem was a bit of an issue. At times, he kind of just gave up on plays when there could have been an opportunity to extend them. So this spring, whenever the team does go live for their scrimmages, that will be a key point to whether or not it is the defensive edges that are really getting that pressure on and turning up the heat in the kitchen for Quinn in the pocket, or if it's Quinn understanding when to get the ball out, throw it away, extend plays, and really use his legs as a, a, a plus in his game rather than uh, something that he can't he, he decides to use when it's there. Okay, guys, let's see here. <laughs> While we're on the subject of Quinn, Zane Petty says if Quinn wins the SEC championship and the national championship, would he pass up Vince as the Longhorn legend quarterback? I say um, no. Well, with the fan base, no, because it had been so long since Texas won a national championship. I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, it had been, what, 35 years officially. Um, so, uh, no, I, I don't think – and look, the thing about – and I tie VY and TJ Ford in together because they are both legends in the Houston area. And that was – that was they came to Texas at such an important time. And TJ led Texas to a Final Four. And Vince led Texas to a national championship. And that, I was at TJ Ford's facility this summer, and Vince, Vince was in there. And his young son, who's going to be a really good basketball player, by, by the way, I think he's seventh grade, um, was in there working out with TJ. And I just looked at those guys when they're having a conversation. I said, you know, those guys changed a lot at the University of Texas. I mean, together. Um, so my answer to, to the football question is no. Um, but I, I will say this, that put you, that would put you way, way up there. That might be the only person you're looking up at. Okay. And let's see here. Let's go to the other side of the football and talk some defense. E. Kim says, good morning from Rockford, Illinois. Who's the sack leader this season? Trey Moore. I, I, and, and that's saying something. I mean, I think Ethan Burke, somebody asked about DN. Let's combine that. Uh, question. I think D end is uh, edge defensive end is going to be a strength of this team this year, CJ. I think Texas has done a good job in recruiting. They've built depth. Baron Sorrell, really good uh, player entering his final season. Ethan Burke continues to ascend. Um, he, he'll be in year three coming up. I think Justice Finkley is strong against the run. Uh, he's a good run defender. Um, then you add in Trey Moore and you add in Colin Simmons and, you know, Colton Vosick. You just got to see what, what his body does. Um, Jamon Taps in year three, right? I mean, so Texas has really upgraded that edge position uh, in a multitude of ways with guys with different skill sets. Uh, but I do think if you're asking who I think is going to lead the team in sacks this year, uh, I think it's going to be Trey Moore. Yep. And the second second spot for me would be Ethan Burke. That length at a, a continued development from what we saw a year ago, I think he'll be a, an issue this year. 
And then we'll go from sacks to interceptions. Zane says, who will lead this team with interceptions and how many will they have? I'll go with Derek Williams. I like what I saw last year, and I think he'll have a, a better understanding of, of route concepts, the scheme defensively, and where he should be. Uh, he has all the athleticism. He Again, he was the best cover uh, defensive back that Texas had by the end of the season. You didn't see him come off the field the second half of that Washington game whenever he was back from his targeting suspension. There's a reason for that. Uh, I'll, I'll say five interceptions is a lot, so I'll go four. Jerry? Um, yeah, I think uh, it, it'll be either Taff or Derek Williams. Um, outside shot, it's Makuba because the way Sark talked about Makuba yesterday kind of caught my attention. So I think it'll be one of the safeties, and I'll go with four. And while we're talking about safeties, guys, KD35, I am the best, says, I saw Michigan's top safety, Rod Moore, suffered a torn ACL in practice on Monday. Yeah, that's that's a very tough injury uh, for Michigan. I mean, look, they have quality depth. Uh, they've evaluated players, and development has been top notch at Michigan. But that's a that's a tough loss for Michigan. All right, Jerry. Well, if you are ready, before we switch gears and talk a little recruiting, I'm going to let you tell folks out there about your one of your favorite sponsors, Manscaped. Look, I mean, I'm not going to do this with the gooder glasses on, but I am going to say, here's the Manscaped 5.0. This episode is brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions, Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom those carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Clear out that nasty winter bush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like springtime flowers just in time to watch the Masters. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code ONTEXAS for 20% off plus free shipping. And here's my big point with this, guys. After using Manscaped, I can finally say I've caught spring fever. No doubt about it. I'm introducing this season's champ. It's the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Uh, it's, it's the one, okay? I love this thing because it comes with a compact case. I take it with me everywhere I go. Hate? Do you hate making a mess? Not to worry. This bad boy's waterproof. Shave in the shower, in the bath, or just dive in the ocean with it. It's coming back up. I don't know if you are, but the Manscaped will be fine. Manscaped.com, 20% off on Texas. I don't know how we're going to follow that act, CJ, but the show most must go on. And uh, we got a couple of good questions here, recruiting wise from Living Rent Free and Yee. So we're going to start with this one. He says, "DK Moore, Kalik Lockett, Andrew Marsh, and Kelshawn Johnson would be a dream wide receiver class." CJ, your thoughts? Yeah, when I was talking to KJ Lacey, actually, he was saying, you know, the the staff is pointing him in the direction to become a recruiter now, and those are the uh, there's three guys that he is really trying to get into. Uh, the recruitments of and trying to lure them down to Texas. The first was to Corian Moore, obviously the LSU commit out of Duncanville, uh, one of the top wide receivers in the entire country. Uh, uh, no surprise to anybody. Uh, Kalik Lockett was another name that he mentioned out of Saxe, the big time wide receiver. He actually threw with uh, to a seven on seven tournament a few weeks ago as well. So there's some familiarity there. And then the third one was Jamie French, the five star, uh, really talented prospect, likes Sarkeesian's offense a lot. And uh, he will be making a trip down to Austin. Those are three really impressive prospects right now. And, again, if, if K.J. Lacey, the quarterback of te uh, the Texas class, is starting to recruit you and start coming at you and saying, all right, come come be a part of something special, I think recruits are going to start listening to that just a little bit. It certainly helps when uh, the signal caller is in the fold early for a class and then starts building upon uh, adding to a class right now. Five guys in the fold. They've all started talking just a little bit right now in this Texas commitment. Uh, but right now, K.J. Lacey looking at three guys at that wide receiver spot that he could certainly uh, uh, see himself throwing to at the next level. And, and I'll add to that, uh, you know, he's talked with Kelshawn Johnson as well. So, I mean, I think that's a, uh, th that's, a, that's a pretty good list to start with. Obviously, Andrew Marsh on campus yesterday. Marcus Harris from Modern Day uh, has a June 21st through 23rd official visit as well. Um, and for those that haven't, like, broken down video and watched those guys, um, you know, Jamie French is kind of the, the hot name outside of the Corian Moore for, for Texas fans. Jamie French is so interesting to me because he's kind of in between A.D. Mitchell and C.D. Lamb for me. 
as a prospect. And that's after the catch. I think he's better than Mitchell uh, on high school tape and and probably just naturally better. He has a little more stop start and in, in, in COD and uh, almost jump cuts type of stuff uh, like a running back does after the catch. Uh, but he's not C.D. Lamb. Those his feet aren't on on fire like C.D. Lamb. I mean, C.D. Lamb's tremendous after the catch. Uh, but if you're wondering about Jamie French as a prospect, I would say he's ahead of A.D. Mitchell because of the after the catch. Maybe not quite C.D. Lamb though, because C.D. Lamb was pretty special after a class in the punt return game. Yeah. And as I said, living rent free in UT actually had two questions here. So we're going to go to this next one. And uh, he says, Jonah Williams, is Texas baseball on board with his recruitment? Jerry, I'll take the baseball part and let you take the football part. I actually reached out to somebody when I saw this question come up. And Texas baseball has seen him. Um, I don't know when the last time they saw him was, but I know for a fact they saw him last summer for sure. Uh, they from my understanding, what they do is they touch base with the football staff. If the football staff is all in on a guy that wants to play two sport, sports, then yes, they will be on board as long as they think he's a fit. So take of that what you will. Now, Jerry, the football yeah. side. I'm leave yeah, so I think Jonah's an Oklahoma lean. Uh, but he'll be in uh, town in April. Then he says he's going to come back and officially visit in June. I can say the first base college baseball experience Jonah ever had, uh, I was talking to him about this. Uh, earlier in the season, I went down there for a basketball practice uh, because he was on a uh, the basketball team at Galveston Ball. Was at it was Texas was a Texas camp. This is the first uh, college baseball experience he ever had. He went to that camp and he did very very well. Uh, and yeah, so the Texas baseball staff has been recruiting him for a while, as has the Texas football staff. Um, I, I think Oklahoma is the team to beat entering the spring here, and, and we'll see what happens. I, I think. You know, one thing about Oklahoma is they had always recruited him as a safety that what is that, that robber bandit position, whatever they call it. That's where they've been recruiting him all along. I mean, some teams have even talked, hey, you want to play wide receiver? I mean, OK, uh, fine. But Oklahoma has been recruiting him at that position the whole way through. Uh, one thing that kind of hurt Texas and, and I'm not saying what Jonah Williams is long term. I'm clearly just talking about his recruitment is Texas was recruiting him at linebacker with Jeff Choate. They've now transitioned back to safety in their recruitment of him, and it's given them a chance. Can they get all the way back and win the recruitment? We'll see. I think Oklahoma has a healthy lead right now headed into visits. And then Antoine wants to know, when is Keelan Russell and Lamont Rogers visiting campus? Lamont Rogers, uh, we broke that news uh, last week. His official visit is June 14th through 16th. Uh, that's when Lamont uh, will be in for an official visit. We'll see if he comes in in April. I think there's a chance he does. Uh, Keelan Russell, uh, April 20th spring game. Uh, it would, same day I expect DeCorey and Moore to visit Texas. And Juju Juice says, I thought Texas made the top 12 for defensive lineman Nathaniel Marshall. Is there a good shot at him? Uh, not a name that I've heard way up on the board right now. Doesn't mean, like, again, though, here's the thing about D-line recruiting in this cycle is Kenny Baker had about five days on the road because one, even after you're hired, you have to go through compliance and NCA. You have to get okay to get the okay to go out and recruit on the road. So that's a couple day process. So Kenny Baker was limited in his time there in January. That's why he hit the Houston area and then went up to Dallas, not spreading yourself out to spending a full day traveling somewhere. Nothing against the out-of-state kids, but it was just bad timing. Uh, that's why you saw Sarkeesian Banks uh, and to short choice, go to O'Galley in Melbourne to see Brandon Brown. Uh, but so what my point is, long winded answer is going out and evaluating these guys in the spring outside of your no brainer guys is still going to be vital for Kenny Baker in Texas on D line recruiting. He's going to get out in the spring evaluation period and see a lot of guys he hasn't seen in person before. Uh, and that, I think, is going to shape the way some of these official visits shake out in June in this 25 class. So that's something to watch there in D-line recruiting because you can't ask the guy to be hired, uh, come in in late January, and then you tell him who to recruit. I mean, Brandon Brown's a no-brainer. Zion Williams is a no-brainer. If a Malik Autry uh, committed to Auburn wants to come visit, that's a no-brainer. Myron Charles will probably go to FSU, but if he wanted to get on campus, that's a no-brainer. But outside of those handful of Josiah Sharma, outside of those handful of guys, you still, he's still got to go out and evaluate these guys and, and, and get to watch their personality and practice, see if it's a fit for him. I mean, I think what a name to watch is Derry Norris out of Port Orange and Spruce Creek. 
about 6'3", 275. He'll be a 300-pound guy one day. I think that's a kid that's impressed Texas. But like I said, now you got to go out. Kenny's got to go out and evaluate that kid in person in May after spring practice is open, that spring evaluation period. So just something to keep in mind with D-line. I think the board's going to shift in May. All right. And then uh, let's see here. We're going to go back to hmm, – I'm sorry, trying to find a good one here. Zane Petty says, does Russell have a stronger arm than Lacey? Jerry, I know we talked about this a little bit yesterday on, on Coffee and Football. Uh, but how much would Russell help with Decorian Moore as well? So the, the whole arm strength thing, this is what I say. Sarkeesian doesn't recruit quarterbacks that can't make all the throws. So uh, this is the way I kind of put that. Both those guys can make all the throws. So who has two miles an hour faster on a jugs gun? I don't really even care about necessarily for Sark's offense. He's going to recruit guys that can make all the throws. So if he's offered you or if he's recruiting you, that is one of the things that he's talked about that many times in press conferences. He said that in recruiting, that uh, on signing day press conferences, that's the number one thing he's looking for. He's not looking in terms of miles per hour. He's looking, can this guy make all the throws in my system? Both those guys can make all the throws in his system. I think that's the important thing uh, right now. And, and those guys are interesting. Like KJ Lacey, haven't been to Sarah Land three times. He's got... He's like an old point guard that's transitioned to quarterback, but he's kind of got that leadership, that little gamesmanship about him. He's got a lot of moxie. He's got a lot of things that coaches really like. There's a reason Lane Kiffin's still recruiting him. There's a reason Oregon's recruiting him. There's a reason uh, Auburn is recruiting him. It, it, it's outside of – it's even outside of his skill set at quarterback. It's all the things that come with him. He's got He's got a little something to him that is really attractive to college football coaches. Yep. All right, Champ Bailey 3, is Taz Williams even interested in Texas? And is Texas interested in Taz? I, I think that one's down the list a little bit. Um, I so I think that's more, that's more of uh, where, where the reality is. I, I'm not sure he's gotten kind of got either the com that combination of that quickness and top-end speed. I, I think maybe a, a little bit behind some other guys. Guys, we got a couple of draft related questions and let's talk about next year's draft. Michael Rodriguez says, What will it take for Quinn to be the number one quarterback taken in next year's draft? And who is his competition for that spot? Yeah, it's going to take an improvement on the, the kind of the issues that we saw from a year ago, you know, converting drives in the red zone, kind of finding that fastball and elusiveness in the pocket. You know, those are three things right now that you can look at and say, All right, if Quinn takes that step up, He's got a pretty good chance to go 1-1. He's got a pretty good chance to be the first quarterback off the board. Uh, if you look at the draft right now and some of the guys that will be in that conversation to compete with Quinn as the first quarterback off the board, Carson Beck comes to mind. Shador Sanders out of Colorado as well. We talked about him. Uh, Carson Beck, I think, has an outside chance. I think he's a uh, he's got an outside chance. Jackson Dart, another guy who got an outside chance to become a, a top guy in this draft, kind of like in that Bo Nix range, you know, the, a guy that you don't necessarily think of as a prototypical number one guy uh, coming into the draft. But, hey, if you put up a good year and a good system, that, those uh, those draft scouts will call, come calling. Uh, I think Quinn right now, and Jerry and I talked about it over the weekend. I actually had him as my number two quarterback in the SEC. I just want to see Quinn take over games. There were six games last year where he only had – one passing touchdown. And there were a number of games where he should have had significantly more. You know, TCU, Iowa State, Wyoming. It felt like there were slow starts against Rice early in the year as well. You know, for a guy that is going to go 1.1, you have to walk in and impact games immediately. So uh, I, I think for Quinn, that's going to be that next step in year three, in which we talked about it should be his junior season as a college kid. Uh, that's going to be what I expect to see. And I think he will take that step. Again, we've talked about command and taking over that quarterback room and breaching into that entire offensive room this year. For Quinn, that's my key, and I think he'll take that step. I, I'll say this. I think 2025 in the NFL draft that quarterback's wide open. Uh, I think it was well, part of the reason it was a great decision to come back, other, other than being a three-year starter, uh, I think is important for Quinn, especially since he missed his senior year high school football and just kind of was in the wilderness at Ohio State for a year. He lost some valuable time there. And from a leadership standpoint and a developmental standpoint, 
Uh, but I think some, so I think guys are going to come out of nowhere next year in the quarterback um, to be mentioned. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't see Shadur as a one, one guy, maybe as a quote, he's a one, one guy. Uh, but otherwise I don't see that. Um, I, I, I think Quinn's the top quarterback. We, we had a good fun discussion about this in the SEC. I think he's the most talented guy as far as the NFL draft. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And I like Carson Beck. Um, what is, you know, take away what you saw this year. Does Drew Alar make a huge step next year? I mean, does a guy like that, um, does a Riley Leonard become a guy in the conversation at Notre Dame? Because he was in a conversation before he got hurt this year. It's, okay, this is this guy going to be a first-round pick this year? Is he going to come this far? Um, I mean, look, he's another David Cutcliffe recruit, and those guys tend to go in the first round, right, even though Cut's retired. Uh, so I think somebody's going to pop up next year that's going to really get in the conversation. Uh, I think with Quinn, I think it's three things. TD, INT ratio. Uh, and I think it, I think it's playing in the pocket, right? And then, I look, the one thing about Quinn is he was a tremendous quarterback in the fourth quarter. If you go look at his quarterback, his, his numbers by quarter, Fourth quarter was his best quarter. That that goes a long way. Um, so if he's if he's a little bit more improved in the red zone, a little bit more improved in the pocket in year three, which I think he will be. Um, I, I, he's got a he's got a good shot. I, I don't know about one one. I think this is going to be a weird draft next year, uh, but I think I could definitely see him playing his way into the top ten. Mm -hmm. And then Ruben says, with the new NFL passing, or I'm sorry, with the NFL passing the new kickoff rules, what are the chances Keelan Robinson gets drafted now? Yeah, I've juggled with this because Rod and I have had some really good conversations about this in the past. You know, the NFL just passed this morning uh, the new kickoff rules that essentially make it so that teams are penalized for kicking touchbacks and they want to bring returns back to the world of the NFL. Uh, something that we haven't seen a whole lot of since they moved the kickoff up to the 30 yard line. I, I wonder how quickly teams will adjust to bringing in those specialists uh, for these teams. You know, they're going to be a, an increase in returns. There's going to be a larger part of those guys like Cordero, uh, Cordero Patterson and, you know, the Devin Hesters of the world that make big time impacts, Jamal Agnew, another, how quickly do teams look at that and say, all right, now we can uh, specialize this guy in our draft. We can raise him up our board because it's going to be a larger part of our game. We're going to have the impact uh, felt a little bit larger than what it was in years past. I'm not sure if we see that immediately or we see a complete reversal of that and we see it instantly and these teams are taken you know, return specialists very early in the draft compared to, you know, these guys coming uh, in as undrafted free agents. So I, I, I don't know. I, I think it certainly helps, but how soon? I don't know if it'll uh, go into effect this year or in years uh, down the road. I'll say this. You know, you know who loved that? Devin DuVernay. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's really him. good for his career longevity. Just signed with Jacksonville. I yeah. need a guy. Um, before we move on, fellas, I'm going to tell folks out there about Texas Electricity Ratings. And uh, for anyone shopping for electricity in the deregulated areas of Texas, TexasElectricityRatings.com is the best place to find a great electricity plan for your household. For starters, it filters out the dangerous and gimmicky plans from providers that are all hat and no cattle when it comes to your monthly bill. You can shop by rate but also by an average bill feature that actually takes into account seasonal usage to give you a real number and not just some placeholder. So if you're looking for a new electricity plan, be sure to check out texaselectricityratings.com slash OTF for the best options available. Hook on. I had time for just a few more questions here, fellas. And uh, let's... I know we talked about the edge briefly a little bit ago, but on the port, Sorrell says, have y'all spoke on the edge room yet? So let's talk about what y'all have seen in practice, maybe what you've heard and what Coach Sark has said during the media session. So, so what I like about the edge uh, position next year is I think they're, I, I think as a whole, it's going to be good against the run. And I think the pass rush additions are going to make it kind of a complete room and a complete position for Texas, along with, they now experience. I mean, Baron Sorrell, fourth year, right? I mean, Ethan Burke, year three. Uh, Jamon Tapp, even a young guy like that, is starting to grow into it. Uh, Justice Finkley in year three. And then you bring in Trey Moore out of the portal, who's a, you know obviously a three-year starter at this point, because I do think he'll start at Texas. 
And then you have the guys, a young guy like Colin Simmons, and you have guys like Zena, Zena, who you never know. I think he's probably needs some time, but you never know what he's going to do, uh, what he's going to look like by August. So what I like about the position is they're going to be good against the run, and I think they've improved as a pass rush room so much under Sarkeesian. I think this is a year where you kind of see it all come together for Texas. And I think Texas fans are real are going to really like what they see from the edge position because of different strengths with different players, the versatility, but they can stand up against the run, against physical teams, and they're going to be able to rush the passer because the difference is getting the quarterback to the ground. You got to get the quarterback to the ground. The PFF pass rush numbers are nice to look at and talk about. You got to get the quarterback to the ground with that position. Yeah, it's one of my favorite uh, position groups to watch while we're at spring practice, Jerry, just because they just look different. You know, they look different than in years past because of the size, because of the length, the athleticism and the drills. You add Trey Moore, you add Colin Simmons, uh, Zena even. Uh, you really look at this group as it's completely flipped on its head a little bit from where it was a few years ago, especially early in Sarkeesian's tenure. Uh, I, I think Baron Sorrell specifically, you look at his upper body, Jerry, he's got it. And, yeah. you know, we've talked about what Tory Beckton has been able to do to a number of these guys each offseason. Uh, he's another conver- uh, uh, another candidate for, you know, looking at, uh, you know, you talk about the underwear Olympics and these combines. You see him in, in shorts and shirts and you're thinking, OK, yeah, that, that kid looks like he can play some good football. Uh, and then you see the guys behind him, Colton Vosick, Zena, Ethan Burke. The length is incredible. And I think that's really encouraging that a lot of these young guys are sitting there you know, kind of molding their body to where you want to be as an elite rusher. Uh, and, of course, uh, Colin Simmons, Trey Moore, two guys with el- elite BGO, and they're able to get out the quarterback quickly. A great combination of skills and talents in this group. And I think, again, that's going to be one of your strengths defensively, and it has to be with how this defensive line uh, interiorly is looking at uh, needing some help on the on the exterior. This next question from Bo Tex Knows. He says, Sark mentioning Juan Davis uh, was a surprise, especially after initially entering the portal. How's he looked in the practices that you guys have viewed? And do you think he'll see the field with Nye Black there? Mm. Now, that's an interesting question because if you pair up Juan Davis with Amari Nye Black, you're, I, I think you're telling on yourself a little bit with what you're going to do. You know, that's a, uh, by all accounts, it's a 12 personnel look. But neither of them are going to be that plus strength, that guy that you have on the interior uh, of your or exterior as a, as a wing in the in the blocking game there. Juan Davis to me is intriguing because he, he has that plus athleticism and he tries to block. He's willing to block, but he, that's not the n- nature of his game. He's not a big physical guy, uh, but he does get in there and get his hands dirty. He's looked good in routes. He's looked smooth. Sarkeesian mentioned him yesterday a little bit as a guy that's been standing out to him whenever his number has been called. My question is how often will his number be called uh, with obviously Amari Nyblack in the full uh, again, talented prospect, but just kind of down that list a little bit on the depth chart. And then Michael Gretzer says, good morning. It's too early, but if you had to put your money on it, who will be the starting left guard? Do you think it'll be Connor Hudson or Missoula? Man, um, it's a tough question. Um, I think uh, Neto has practiced unbelievably well the last three weeks of the season and early in spring. So I think he's taken a big step in terms of consistency. Um, when the, when Kyle Flood turns on the practice tape the last three weeks of the year, he saw a different player from talking to multiple people. So I think that is – it'll be interesting to see this, this Hayden Connors uh, years of starting and experience play a lot of snaps, a lot of big games. Um, does that keep him uh, as a starter? But here's the thing. I think, I think Texas is going to play multiple guys. I really think Texas is going to – they've built depth. I think they're going to use that depth uh, on the offensive line this year. Uh, by the way, I want to say this about Juan Davis as well. I think I think he's – Juan's always been a guy that had tremendous hands. I mean, he was at uh, the Deion Sanders Prime 21 camp in Arlington Martin one year, and he had better hands than all the receivers out there. And there were some guys that have been drafted or going to be drafted out there. Um, he wasn't – maybe the longest arm guy so and didn't have the biggest frame. So he's kind of always been an in-between player. Um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, moving forward. It's going to be tough to crack those reps when you have Gunnar Helm and you have Nye Black there. 
Uh, this will probably be the last one for t- actually. We're gonna go two more. Uh, Fresh sixty four seventy three on a scale of one. That's how worried are you about the current current interior defensive line playing in the SEC for the first time? What you I, I'm not. I'm not because I'm not concerned about them playing in the SEC. Um, there's too much experience. Alfred Collins is a very experienced player. Broughton is a very experienced player. Uh, Savayex very experienced player. Um, you have guys like Aaron Bryant who've been in the program. A, a while now. So uh, Texas has experience. And I think that's kind of what Sark was talking to CJ in his press conference last week is I think he, they, he felt like well, maybe we're not getting enough credit for D line uh, because he knows they have experienced players. They've had years in weight room. They've had years of power five football. Uh, so I think they're going to be okay um, playing in the SEC. I think as a pass rush unit, I actually think, I actually think they're going to surprise a little bit in that regard. I mean, you know, if you look, Savea is a better, by the numbers, is a even bit a better pass rusher disruptor than even Vernon Broughton was. And he look, he was on a good team uh, at Arizona. He ha- he had some interesting numbers there. Uh, so I think I think Texas is actually ready for the SEC. Now the question is, you come into about three four games on the schedule where you really have to anchor against the run, uh, and Michigan's going to be one of those. But, you know, Kentucky's going to try to run the ball at you. That's why they're a bad matchup for Georgia. And Georgia, they give up 160 yards against them. It's a bad matchup. Georgia's going to try to run it at you, right? I mean, so you can go down the schedule. You can pick out the teams that are going to test your ability to anchor. But I think I think Texas is fine from an experience standpoint, strength and mass in the weight room standpoint. But are how are they going to anchor in those key games? And that, look, there's going to be an addition. Somebody asked about the spring portal window. It's April 15th through 30th. Uh, somebody asked that question. So uh, Texas is going to add somebody at D-line in the portal. Make no mistake. The question will be, will they add two? We'll find out. And then the last question for today, Chris Young. Do you guys see us using more tailor-made packages on defense, depending on what the offense is running, or do we need to develop a consistent identity? I think you'll consistently see guys swapping in and out. You'll get different looks, obviously. Uh, the question is whether or not you fit it to, you know, kind of adjust to what the offense is looking at by a, a substitution uh, factor, if that makes sense. You, you know, I, I look at this Texas defense in the back end and see a lot of versatility. Uh, Andrew McCuba's had time up in the box. Uh, Jade Barron's played out wide if needed to be. Uh, again, Derek Williams, Michael Taft, plenty of snaps back deep. Those guys, to me, I think you can be interchangeable. And because you've had guys like Makubo, who despite only being about 185, 190 pounds, he's played in the box and he's played well in the box. Uh, you pair him up with Makuba and kind of use those guys as, as guys that you can spin down. You'll be able to have versatile looks with keeping the same personnel on the group or on the field, which is encouraging to me in the sense that you can go light, in the, in the secondary, in that back seven, while still having a presence with guys like Anthony Hill and David Mendez or linebackers in the run game. Uh, John A. Barron, again, a, a guy who just is instinctive and intellectual uh, as a football player, he, he's a guy that can make plays in the run game. So I don't think you're, you're going to need to see a whole change-up of personnel depending on the matchup because these guys can do it. Uh, it, it will be interesting to see. When you do play those Kentuckys, those Georgias, those Michigans, uh, how often is Maurice Blackwell on the field at your sound linebacker spot, uh, taking a DB off and just going big in your front seven? I, I think you'll see a lot of Maurice Blackwell this year. Hey, by the way, I want to say one thing. We have a really fun conversation on Jalen Milrow in the chat. I want to say this about Milrow. He's going to be one of the more fascinating players in college football for me to watch this year. Because Kalen DeBoer is his coach now. I, I, I'm really interesting this, interested to see how much of the scheme does Kalen DeBoer incorporate with Milrow versus what he did at Washington. And how, how big of a jump can Milrow make under DeBoer this year? It'll be second year starting. I think he's going to be a fascinating player to watch because of those things. And the third thing. If K- I think Kalen DeBoer is going to scheme probably pretty perfectly for him. So I think it's going to be interesting to see this De- DeBoer mask, maybe some of the in- inaccuracy deficiencies that Milrow has in the intermediate game. Um, I, because I, one thing I think Kalen DeBoer's strengths are is 
I think he makes guys look even better than they are. And I think that's a mark of a great coach. I think he masks deficiencies very well. And then I think he can scheme to those players' strengths. I, I That makes Milro a pretty fascinating guy to watch this year. Um, UT boy, I, I I don't know if he sent in a super chat. Um, <laughs> hey, we say it's we say it's Jante's world every day. Yeah, I didn't, but UT boy, I didn't see any questions. I told him to send them, but I I never saw one unless I'm uh, missing it. So I I don't know there. But if I did, my apologies. And we didn't get to a few other questions as well. It looks like so. Much. We ran out of time, unfortunately, but to be sure to head on over to ontexasfootball.com to continue the conversation, we'd like to say thank you to our sponsors today, Texas Electricity Ratings, Gooder, and of course, Manscaped. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for the super chats. We definitely appreciate that. Guys, anything that y'all uh working on or that going to be back later? What, what do folks need to know? Yeah, I'm going to put up uh, some recruiting notes a little bit later here. We also have a recruiting breakdown, CJ and I, today. Uh, so we're going to get into maybe some of the new news, maybe take a look at D-line recruiting today a little bit, uh, because I do think we had the news there on, on Texas football yesterday evening that DJ Sanders is expected in from Belleville uh, April 6th and June 21st, 23rd for an official visit. Somebody also asked um, uh, best players out of Belleville. Well, Ted Coy was pretty good guys out of Belleville. Hi. Um, but, you know, then we had we had a little bit of news as well um, with D-line recruiting. Uh, we, we'll talk about Brandon Brown post-visit. Somebody mentioned USC's making runs at Brandon Brown, Dorian Brew. Uh, USC's uh, taking defensive recruiting extremely, 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 extremely serious in the 2025 uh, cycle. So, uh, look, I think moving forward, Texas is going to battle USC on a lot of guys, and they're going to battle um, LSU, obviously, A&M and Oklahoma in-state. And then every, the farther you go east, the more SEC schools you're going to battle. But USC is going to be at the forefront of some of those battles as well. USC just went in the South Georgia and got Isaiah, Isaiah Gibson out of Warner Robins. We'll see if it sticks. They're getting some guys early. A lot of time left. I don't think the uh, real gamesmanship in recruiting started quite yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, good on USC for getting out ahead of the game on about three or four guys. All right, guys. Well, be sure to, uh, like I said, head on over to ontexasfootball.com. If you haven't already, like and subscribe, please. We would appreciate that. Ring the bell so you're notified anytime the guys go live, post a video, whatever it may be. And for CJ Vogel and Jerry Hamilton, I'm Blake Monroe, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.